Amen. Thank you, choir. It's great to see you gathered around this morning, and my hope is that you have come prepared to worship the Lord with all of your heart, soul, mind, body, and strength. Have you done that today? Amen. Amen. It's good to see you here. If you're visiting with us for the first time, special welcome to you. Thanks for taking time to be here and worship with us this morning. In between the seats is a blue welcome card. It'd be great if you would just take a few minutes to fill that out, and after the service, you head out into the lobby, look to your right, you'll see a room called the Connections Room. And some of our pastors will be there after the service, and they, would, they have a gift for you, and we'd just like to get to know who you are, so see how we as a church can help you and your family. Well, I want to thank you as a church for being on mission uh, this month. It's been so exciting. We've had two presentations, Full House Friday night and last night. So thank you for inviting people to come and hear the good news of this new life that we have in Jesus Christ. And uh, I want to thank everyone for serving from the office to ladies who are taking care of tickets, parking lot, hospitality. It's just been incredible to see so many people advancing the mission of the gospel this weekend. So thank you so much for your participation in that. And just a couple of reminders about some upcoming events around this season. Next Sunday night at 6 p.m. is our special Spark Family Christmas event where his kids and his little kids will be performing at 6 p.m. next Sunday night. So if you have grandkids or neighbors with little kids, you'll want to make sure and bring them next Sunday night at 6. And then on Christmas Eve at 6 p.m. we'll also have our uh, Christmas Eve service, which will be at 6 o'clock. So I just encourage us as we head towards the end of this year, let's continue to give generously to the advancement of the mission of gospel, not only through invitation, for serving, but also in our giving to the mission. Amen. Amen. Let's continue to worship our great God. Thank you, Pastor Calvin. Well, it's great to be able to gather and raise our voices in song and praise to our King. And I'm going to invite you to stand as we sing uh, this carol, Hark, the herald angels sing glory to the newborn King. Let's worship our Lord Jesus Christ together this morning. Let's sing together. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the sky.
King of heaven, come now. Let your glory reign, shining like the day. King of heaven, come. King of heaven, rise up. Who can stand against us? You are strong to say. Praise our great God and King that the King of Heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ, came as a gift to Emmanuel. And he's coming back again to continue to reign as King. Let's continue to lift him up. Oh, come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Give praise to our King.
Well, as we continue in our adoration of the King this morning, let's turn our hearts to him in prayer. God, we adore you. We come before you this morning in great awe of who you are. God, you are creator of everything that exists. But not only did you create everything, you sustain everything that you created. You are our sustainer this morning, and we adore you. You transcendently rule your creation. You are far above your creation. And yet you imminently dwell within your creation, Lord. You dwell within your people today. And Lord, you dwelt among us a couple thousand years ago through sending your son. So Lord, we come before you in great adoration this morning. We adore you. God, we adore you as healer. Lord, there are many in our midst who are in need of your healing. Lord, we pray for Roger, Susanna, Gord, Denise, Dave, Diana, Larry, Rhoda, Larry. Lord, these are a few names that represent many in our family and, and friends, I'm sure, who are hurting, who, who have need this morning for your healing hand. Lord, it is our desire to see people restored to health, restored through the brokenness and the sickness and the pain that they are experiencing. So Lord, we pray for healing for these people and for those that we know in our extended families, our extended friends who need your healing hand upon their lives this morning, Lord. God, we adore you as comforter. And when, when brothers and sisters ache, when brothers and sisters grieve, we all grieve as a family. And Lord, there's some families who need your, your comforting this morning. Lord, we pray for Terry Eldridge and the family on the passing of her brother. We pray for Ruth Babcock and the family on the passing of her brother Harry. And Lord, we pray for the family and friends of Arlene Doidge, all who have experienced loss this week. So Lord, as we mourn the loss of Terry's brother and Ruth's brother and Arlene, Lord, may, may we experience your comfort that you have promised to your people. Lord, thank you that you provide great comfort in times of grief, so that even as we grieve, we don't grieve as those who have no hope, but rather we can grieve as those who have hope, as a sure and steady anchor, not in ourselves, not in our circumstances, but in you, Lord. We also think of John Trey this morning and pray that he would experience your comfort as he and many others who he represents have ailments or limitations that prevent them from joining us regularly on Sundays as they would like to in their hearts. So Lord, I pray for John this morning that he would particularly experience your nearness and your comfort to him. God, may we do well ministering to him and reminding him of not only your love for him, but our love for him. Lord, thank you that you empower God, thank you for you have, how you have empowered Pastor Kelvin to bring your word and teach, teach your word. So Lord, we pray for him this morning as he brings your word that he would do so with great clarity of, of mind and heart to deliver what you have to say. And Lord, may we be ready to respond in obedience to you. However your spirit leads, however your spirit moves in us, may we be quick to obey you, God. Thank you for how you empower our missions partners. Lord, we pray for Mary Baldwin and the work that she's doing with Greater European Mission. And we pray for Freedom Global Outreach in Haiti. Lord, thank you that we are not left to your mission alone, but rather your mission that you have forgiven us is possible because you empower us through your spirit. So Lord, we pray for these two organizations, the people who work for them, as they minister particularly to those that society rejects, to orphans, to widows, to men and women who need you. Lord, may, may they continue to rely on your empowerment for the ministry that you have put before them each day. And then, Lord, we adore you because you are a provider. Thank you for how you provide for us. Thank you that because you are our good shepherd, we shall lack nothing, we shall want nothing. So, Lord, I thank you that you have provided for us and out of the generosity of your provision for us, Lord, may we give generously to you knowing that everything we have is yours. And then may you multiply our efforts, may you multiply our resources so that your kingdom work will go forward in this world. 
Lord, thank you for how that is happening this weekend in our church with these productions and services this weekend. Lord, may you multiply the, the fruit that comes out of that this weekend, Lord. So we, we praise you and thank you and adore you this morning. And in Jesus' name, amen. This time of year is so wonderful for us to have the opportunity to sing of the gospel over and over again in songs of the season and in carols. And so I'm going to invite us to stand together once again. And as we sing this next carol, our children right up to grade eight can uh, go at this time to their programs uh, as we sing the carol, Angels from the Realms of Glory. Let's continue to raise our voices to our King, the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. Let's sing. Angels from the realms of glory, wing your fire o'er all the earth. He who sang creation story, now proclaim Messiah's birth. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the newborn In the field 
good to sing praises to our worthy king Emmanuel God with us you may be seated thank you pastor Steve and worship team and uh, those who are serving the Lord playing the instruments this morning can we show our appreciation for the service of our brothers and sisters to the Lord? We are very blessed as a church, and uh, I hope you never take for granted what we get to enjoy together each, uh, each week. And we've just sung a, an amazing truth, which we're going to focus on this morning. Emmanuel, God with us. Let's pray and ask God to focus our minds and remove distractions so that we might truly embrace the truth of Emmanuel. Father, thank you for allowing us to be here this morning. Thank you for giving us the health and strength to be here. It is a privilege. And now, God, as we just wait to hear from you, I pray that you would speak to us through your word. I pray that you would awaken us to the truth that you came to be with us. Thank you so much. Jesus, our Lord and Savior, for being willing to come so that we do not have to live this life on our own. Not only that, we can live this life with confidence and hope, knowing that we will be with you for eternity. What an amazing Christmas gift. Absolutely incredible. So I pray that you would speak to us this morning and awaken our hearts and our minds to the incredible truth that, God, you came to be with us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know if you have noticed in your life or not, but I sure have. There's a danger when something becomes so familiar to us that we forget just how amazing it really is. I had one of those moments this week. I was sitting at home and uh, I was awakened and new to the reality of how blessed I am by my wife and how blessed my kids are to have a mom like Jen. It just hit me. I was like, the sacrificial love that she shows for us, working full time, serving, and then at home, just giving everything she has to express her love for myself and for our kids. And so I was wise, gentlemen. I went to Metro and I bought some flowers. <laughs> yep, I did. I didn't even go to Value Village. I went to Metro. <laughs> Got flowers. And then I went to Shoppers because uh, my wife has this crazy thing about gnomes. I don't know what it is. But uh, she had bought one for a gift exchange that my daughter April had with her DC group. And I heard my wife say, you always keep your ears open, guys. I heard my wife say, man, I can't believe I got a gift that I want and I'm giving it away. So, of course, I went and looked for that gnome. 
and found the last one on the shelf. <laughs> so I thought. So I came home and she went, wow, flowers and a gnome. Th and do you notice, honey, it's the one that you wanted, that you gave away? Ah, that's so cool, thank you. And it was just a great moment, Hallmark moment, actually. <laughs> Until the next day, she had already gone to work and I was putting my shoes on the stairs and a bag fell. What rolled out of the bag? The gnome she wanted. She had gone back and bought one and then felt so bad that I had bought it, she tried to hide it. Make sure your sins will find you out. So someone's going to get a gnome for Christmas this year. You know, I think about our own bodies. All of us have a routine. Every morning we get up. We all have our own routine. And I'm glad none of us showed up today, just rolled out of bed and showed up. You all did your routine. I did my routine this morning. But most days we probably don't stop to think just how fearfully and wonderfully we are made. For example, this week I was doing some research, research that just blew my mind away. Did you realize that a cough releases an explosive charge of air that moves at speeds of up to 96 kilometers an hour. I have heard a lot of fast wind in the choir room this week before the performances. And did you know that a sneeze can exceed a charge of air up to 160 kilometers an hour? That's why this is so important. What about our skin? This, this fascinated me. Did you realize that each square inch of human skin consists of 20 feet of blood vessels? And lined up end to end, all our body's blood vessels would measure 99,780 kilometers. In other words, it would circle the Earth's equator four times. What about our brains? Were you aware that your brain sends messages at the rate of 386 kilometers an hour? That now explains why we have so many headaches. That's a lot of speed going on in, in small space. And when it comes to your blood, did you realize 400 gallons of it flows through your kidneys every day? Finally, there's the miracle of life. At only 19 days after life begins at conception, a baby's eyes begin to develop. Eventually, each eye will have 6 million cones which help you see color and 120 million rods which help you see black and white. The heart begins to beat at day 22 in the womb. By week six, brain waves are detectable, and at eight weeks, every organ is in place, and the fetus can begin to hear. And at three months, when a mother usually finds out she is pregnant, an unborn baby's fingerprints appear. How fearfully and wonderfully are we made? When I read those stats this week, I just went, wow. You see, the danger, like I said, is that even something like the birth of Jesus Christ can become so familiar to us that we truly neglect to appreciate just how amazing the event was in Bethlehem of Judea over 2,000 years ago. J.I. Packer, one of the most influential theologians of the 20th century who spent the second half of his life living in Canada, said this about this miraculous mystery. It is here in the thing that happened at the first Christmas that the profoundest and most unfathomable depths of the Christian revelation lie. This is why it is critical that each year in the midst of all the, the busyness and the commercialization of Christmas, we as a church family intentionally prioritize opening God's word. And I encourage you in your own homes over the season, not just the season, but throughout the year, open God's word in order to recount the miraculous and mysterious way God came to be with us. And so I'd ask you to turn your Bibles this morning to Matthew chapter 1. We'll begin reading in verse 18 and we'll read to the end of the chapter. We're starting a three-week Christmas series called, For God so loved the world He gave us. And this morning He gave us Himself. Matthew chapter 1 verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. 
She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son and he gave him the name Jesus. This is the amazing word of God to us this morning. And I want to remind us of three amazing facts about how God gave himself to us so that we won't just think it's routine every year. The first fact of how God came to us is he came to us as a baby. As a baby. Verse 18 says, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. That birth translated as Genesis, origin. And Matthew opens up this chapter with this mind-blowing foundational truth that Jesus the Messiah, eternal Son of God, the second person of the triune God, arrived to be with us as a human baby. Born of a woman just like every one of us. But make no mistake, he existed before his physical birth. In John chapter 1 verse 1 we read, In the beginning was the Word, referring to Christ, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in John 1.14, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. As I read a devotional written by one of our own pastors, Pastor Daniel Scott, our youth pastor, he asked an important question in this piece of uh, Bible study that he wrote. This was the question, have you paused recently to reflect on this reality? That creator God, the God of the universe, came to dwell among us first as a baby. As a baby, we often forget that. Yes, he came as a crying, cooing, bedwetting baby boy. We must never forget his true humanity, his true divinity, and his true humility. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 to 8, referring to the mindset of Jesus Christ, we read, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. How did he do that? By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient even to death on the cross. So that means that Jesus being fully human, possessed the full range of human characteristics. And I'm just going to mention some of them to us this morning so that you will hear this familiar story again, but I trust through the power of the Holy Spirit that you will realize just how amazing it really is. Jesus is like us physically in that he possesses a human body, different from ours now that his body is resurrected and glorified. But prior to his resurrection, like you and I, he too grew tired at points. Any of you feeling exhausted these days? Yes, the sovereign creator of the universe took on the human limitations of being dependent on sleep. And I found that so encouraging because as I get older, I realize I can rejoice on becoming more like Jesus. He took naps. I love naps. Now I view it as sanctification. I have a new line for Jen now. Not only will my line be in five minutes, I'll help you with those. I'm going to be like Jesus, honey. I'm dependent on sleep. Not only did Jesus grow weary, but he also became hungry. As a baby, he needed to be fed and nursed and nurtured because his body is just like ours. He was also fully human mentally. He possessed a human mind just like us. Luke records in his gospel that Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature. He learned in the same way other children do. You know, sometimes we uh, 
we seem to have this idea that Jesus must have come out of the, the womb using words like kingdom, <laughs> righteousness, substitution and propitiation. Can you imagine? We're just looking for that first word one of our kids says is mama. But here's the problem. Sometimes we don't have the right perspective. Jesus had to learn to say the first century Jewish equivalent to mama and dada. He possessed a human mind. He was also like us emotionally. In Matthew's Gospels, if you, if you read it, we see the full range of human emotions displayed in Jesus. For example, in Matthew chapter 26, verses 36 and 39, and then again in the Gospel of John, chapter 33, verse 35, we read that Jesus' soul was troubled and overwhelmed to the point where he too wept. I don't know what's going on in your home and in your life, but I can guarantee you, if we were to sit down and have a coffee, there's many of us in this room who over this past month or even this past year, our souls have been troubled and overwhelmed. Even to the point where we too have wept. It also seems reasonable then to conclude that because Jesus was fully human, he must have also laughed and smiled. As one author said, Jesus was not a boring guy. If you don't believe me, look at the people who followed him. He wasn't a boring guy. He is like us physically. He was also fully human mentally. He was also like us emotionally. And finally, he was like us outwardly. His humanity was plain for all to see. And the people who were closest to Jesus for much of his life, like his own brothers and the people in his hometown, recognized him merely as a man. That was one of the problems. But they only recognized him merely as a man. Just like every one of us, he was fully human. Why is that important for us to understand this Christmas? Because it should encourage us. Be encouraged. We have a Savior who is familiar with our struggles physically, mentally, and emotionally. We can never say to him, you don't understand. Because he does. He does understand. There is someone in this world who totally, 100% understands your physical, mental, and emotional struggles. Listen to what we read in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 to 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. So here's the good news of this Christmas and every Christmas that has been since Jesus came. We can approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. That is good news. That is good news. So if you're struggling physically, mentally, emotionally today, know that you have a high priest who completely can empathize. And through him, you have access to go boldly before the throne of grace for help in your time of need. Being fully human, Jesus possessed the full range of human characteristics. Yet, we must not forget at the same time, he remained fully God. God the Son. The babe in the manger also possesses the full range of divine characteristics. And Matthew records in his gospel how Jesus displayed his divine nature while being fully human. And what happened in my mind this week as Pastor Nick was praying, my mind was blown away with this familiar story that we read every year. It is mind-boggling. I said to him, Pastor Nick, I so understand now, if it wasn't for the gift of faith to believe, how could I believe what I'm reading? This is like out of a sci-fi movie. Faith is so important. That's why it's called a gift from God. So how did he display his divine nature while well, fully human? He has power over diseases. We know throughout the Gospels he was able to cleanse lepers, give sight to the blind, and cause the lame to walk. He has command over nature. In Matthew chapter 8, Jesus rebukes the storm and it immediately calms down. 
To which his disciples respond, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the sea obey him. He has authority over sin. Praise God. Remember in Matthew chapter 9, verses 1 to 6, Jesus forgives the sins of a paralyzed man and then heals him physically as well. He has control over death. Jesus not only brings others to life, but also had the authority to lay down his own life and authority to take it up again. He is fully able to identify with us, and as God, Jesus is fully able to identify with God. Amazing. Amazing. While clearly, listen closely, while clearly Jesus' human nature and divine nature are different, that is, they are distinguished in certain ways, we affirm that Jesus' human nature and divine nature are unified in one person. They are unified in one person. His divine and human natures are always working in perfect unity. This is why the incarnation God coming to us in flesh through the person of Jesus Christ is the most profound mystery in the whole universe. And if you don't believe me, listen to these true statements and just let your brain be rattled. He was born a baby and he sustains the universe. He was 30 years old and he exists eternally. He was tired and all-powerful. He died, and he conquered death. He was returned to heaven, and he is present with us now. And think back to those cartoons. This is where you go. (laughs) Think about that. This is the babe in the manger. When you put these truths concerning Jesus' nature together, you begin to realize that the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, is so much more than just what we remember it each year as, as a babe in a manger. Jesus, the Son of God, himself took on human flesh. The doctrine of Jesus' full humanity and full deity is the most extraordinary miracle in the whole Bible. He came to us as a baby. Never forget his true humanity. Never forget his true divinity. And never forget his true humility. Secondly, though, he came to us born of an engaged virgin. What is miraculous about how God came to us is Jesus' earthly mother, Mary, who gave birth to him in Bethlehem of Judea, was an engaged virgin. I emphasize engaged because we often just go, he was born of a virgin. We get that. But this is what hit me this week. No, he was born of an engaged virgin, pledged to be married to Joseph. Why is that significant? Before Mary and Joseph had consummated their marriage physically, she was pregnant. The word pledged, also translated engaged or betrothed, was much more serious and binding in the first century than it is today in the 21st century we live in. I always chuckle sometimes when God brings two young people together and they're so in love and they're excited and they get married and uh, you ask them, how are plans going? When's the wedding date? Uh, Well, we don't know. We're just excited to be engaged, which is awesome. But it was very different back in the time when Mary and Joseph were living. To the Jewish people in that day, engagement was equivalent to marriage. Except the man and the woman did not live together. Did you know that they were even called husband and wife? And at the end of the engagement period, which was usually a year, so I went, oh, so that's, maybe that's where that comes from. Often engagements are a year. They're usually a year. The only thing left to do was for the woman to go to the man's home to physically consummate the marriage and for them to begin to live together. So when Matthew says that before they came together, she was found to be pregnant. He is affirming that Mary was with child while still an engaged virgin. Unlike some would argue simply that she was a young woman. So how could this be? Well, we saw in second half of verse 18. 
His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Jesus was conceived in Mary by a creative, supernatural miracle of the Holy Spirit. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 1. We will read verse 26 to 35, the account of how this happened. Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin, not just a young woman, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. That is a great line. No word from God will ever fail. And how did Mary respond? I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word be to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. As I was studying this week, something caught my attention. Have you ever noticed the similarities between Jesus' physical birth and our spiritual birth? They are both an act of God, the Holy Spirit. Listen to how John describes being born again spiritually and think about the situation Mary now faces. John chapter 1 verse 12 and 13 says this, To all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of a natural descent, nor of a decision, nor of a human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. Isn't that interesting? And Matthew chapter 1 verse 16 makes it clear that Jesus' birth was different from that of any other Jewish boy named in the genealogy where we read in Matthew chapter 1 through verse 1 through 17. There we read that Joseph is not called the father of Jesus Christ. Rather, he is referred to as the husband of Mary. And Mary was the mother of Jesus who is called the Messiah. You see, Jesus was born of an earthly mother without the need of an earthly father for conception to occur. If Jesus Christ was conceived and born just as any other baby, then he could not be God. It was necessary for him to enter this world through an earthly mother, but not to be conceived through an earthly father. So by a miracle of the Holy Spirit, Jesus was conceived in the womb of Mary, an engaged virgin. Not to be misunderstood as some sort of divine human cohabition, cohabitation. Sometimes seen and you'll read about it in pagan mythology. No, this was a miracle, supernatural miracle by the Holy Spirit. You recall in Genesis chapter 315, what does God promise? A seed of woman. Specifically, he promises to raise up a seed, singular offspring who would crush the head of Satan, the serpent. And here in Matthew, we see the fulfillment of that promised seed in Mary. It's amazing. The parallels between Genesis and Matthew can be drawn out even further. Listen, in Genesis, a man is born who would give into sin. Adam initially lived in perfect communion with his creator before rebelling against God and falling into sin. And Paul reminds us in Romans 5 that from Adam's one sin, condemnation came to all men. 
Every one of us. But with Jesus, the story is different. In the virgin birth, Jesus did not inherit a sinful nature, nor did he inherit the guilt that other humans like you and I inherit from Adam. In Jesus, a new Adam has come on the scene. A man who would not give in to sin. In contrast to the first Adam, Jesus is born to save people from their sin. So through the miracle of the virgin conception, Jesus remained qualified to be our Savior. That is great news. You need to understand, Jesus, the babe in the manger, is 100% qualified to be our Savior. The perfect, sinless sacrifice for our sin on our behalf. Be encouraged. Be encouraged. God came to us in a way that meant Jesus was qualified to save us from our sins. That's great news. Put yourself in this young couple's shoes. Mary, having never had a physical relationship with a man, finds out she's pregnant. Ladies, imagine the thoughts, emotions, confusion, and the worry that would be going through your mind. Or men, consider Joseph. As a husband, you've yet to bring your wife into your home to consummate the marriage, and you find out that she's pregnant. There could only be one possible explanation in your mind. She has clearly been with another man. What would you do if you discovered that the woman you love, the one you've chosen to marry, was pregnant right before you took her into your home? In those days, if an engaged woman pledged to be married, was found to be pregnant, it was considered adultery and was punishable by stoning. We talked about stoning last week, didn't we? But there's a third amazing fact about how God came to us that perhaps I've overlooked in the past. Remember I said there's a danger when something just becomes so familiar, you, you tend to forget how amazing it really is. I think in the past I've understood how amazing that Jesus came as a baby. But this week the whole understanding of his incarnation, God coming to be with us, Jesus coming and taking on human flesh just again expanded my appreciation and my realization of how little I really know about my amazing Savior, Jesus Christ. I think in the past I've, you know, understood, yeah, it's a miracle. Jesus came, born of a virgin, okay? But born of an engaged virgin? Wow. Wow. And all that's involved culturally with that? Wow, that's incredible. But one area I think perhaps I have allowed to just become too familiar and I haven't focused on it is this a third amazing fact. He not only came as a baby, born of an engaged virgin, conceived by the Holy Spirit, but he also came to us under the care of a righteous, earthly, adoptive father. Just put that sentence together. When you picture babe in a manger, God came to us as a baby, fully human, fully divine. Born of an engaged virgin, conceived by the Holy Spirit under the watchful care of a righteous, earthly, adoptive father. Joseph, Mary's husband, was a man, it says in verse 19, faithful to the law, indicating that he was a righteous man. Some of your translations may actually refer to him as that. Joseph, a righteous man. Who else was given that title? Genesis chapter 6, verse 9, the same term, righteous man, is used to describe Noah. Noah. Both of these men were true believers in God who lived by God's righteous standards. That's because true believers of God take his word seriously. And you know what's amazing? One 
was used by God to save the human race from being wiped out by a flood. And the other, Joseph, was used by God to become the adoptive earthly father of the one who would save his people from their sins. Gentlemen, do you think it's important that as men we live righteous lives? God notices. And he's longing to look for men who he can use for his grand and great purposes of advancing his mission. Noah and Joseph were both righteous men and were both given by God's grace incredible assignments that all of us here tonight are the benefactors of. And so because of Joseph's righteous character, he handles this terrible situation. He now finds himself in very differently than probably most of the men living in his day and time. And what does he do? He shows mercy. He shows mercy towards Mary. He withholds what Mary deserves. That's mercy when you withhold something that someone deserves. Grace is receiving undeserved favor. Mercy is holding back what someone deserves. And not wanting to publicly disgrace her as he could have according to the law, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. To send her away secretly as some translations worded by obtaining a legal divorce. Interesting. That shows the difference between engagement today and engagement back then. It was necessary in order to dissolve an engagement in those days. You could go get a legal divorce. Joseph was a righteous man. And because he's a righteous man, God speaks to men who want to live according to God's word. And in verse 20 and 21, we see that an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Joseph had this idea, which was permissible, but is not what the Lord wanted. And so the Lord spoke to him in a dream through an angel. And although the virgin birth is so familiar to us, it was absolutely unheard of for Joseph. We just hear it and go, oh, okay. It was totally unheard of for Joseph. And the angel tells Joseph that Mary will give birth to a son. It's interesting, as I was reading it, I thought, huh. So the young adults who are so excited at having these big gender reveal parties, it's old hat. The angel told Joseph Mary's going to have a son. I asked my wife, I wonder if that's the first gender reveal party. <laughs> Quite something. A son Joseph had no part of bringing about. Don't forget that. Joseph, the woman you're pledged to is going to give birth to a son. He had no part in bringing about. And is told by the angel, give him the name Jesus. Because he will save his people from their sins. Remember in verse 18 it says, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. Messiah meaning the anointed one. As the anointed one, the Son of God came in human flesh in order to be the Savior of mankind. This was God's ordained purpose for Jesus. Why? Because mankind failed to fulfill God's law. Christ had to come in the flesh under the law to fulfill the law on our behalf. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 5.17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And then in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Why Christmas? A blood sacrifice was required. And of course, a blood sacrifice requires a body of flesh and blood. This was the whole plan of God for the miraculous and mysterious incarnation of Christ at Bethlehem in Judea. And without it, Christ could not really die. And the cross is meaningless and you and I are still living in our sins. That is why in verse 22 we read, all this took place. What took place? God came as a baby, 
born of an engaged virgin, conceived by the Holy Spirit, under the care of a righteous, earthly, adoptive father. All that took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. God with us. God came to be with us so that we could be with him eternally. God made a way through the virgin birth of Christ for humanity to be rescued from our sin and be reconciled to God. We don't know exactly how Joseph felt at this point, but I imagine he was puzzled. Nevertheless, he demonstrates something for us to learn through his response, and that is this. Obedience to God's word, even when it is difficult, reflects genuine love for God. Obedience to God's word, even when it is difficult. Men, put yourself in Joseph's shoes. His response reflects genuine love for God. Joseph didn't ask for the, another night's sleep to see if anything would change. No, he simply obeyed. And when it says that he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to his son, Scripture is telling us plain and clear that Joseph did not have physical relations with Mary until Jesus was born. And the chapter ends in verse 25 by telling us that Joseph called the child Jesus, just as the angel had told him to. Wow. These are the amazing ways the king of creation came to be with us. God loved us so much, he gave us himself in the person of Jesus. He came to us as a baby born of an engaged virgin, conceived by the Holy Spirit, under the care of a righteous, earthly, adoptive father. Wow. Wow. The miraculous and mysterious way in which God loved us so much that he gave us himself, Emmanuel, reveals, this is so important, I don't know how anyone can argue against this, reveals the truth that salvation is totally the work of a loving, supernatural, heavenly Father. There's no way you can argue that. Look at the Christmas story. Look at the amazing facts about how God came to be with us. Salvation is totally the work of a loving and supernatural heavenly Father, not the work of of man. There is nothing we can do to save ourselves from our sins. And that is no more evident than the way Jesus the Messiah entered the world. Be encouraged. Because God the Son came, spiritual adoption to sonship with God the Father is available, enabling one to become God's child. Be encouraged. As I close, I want to read to you from Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 to 7. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. Listen. Because of God coming to us in the flesh, in the person of Jesus Christ, you need to tell yourself every day you get up, you are no longer a slave, but God's child. You are God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. 
Why? Because God loved the world so much, He gave us Himself. Let's pray. Father, please forgive us. Forgive us for the times when we just go through this Christmas season, mock 40, stressed to the max, tired, exhausted, that we don't even pause to contemplate a story that is so familiar to us, and yet we've lost our understanding of just how amazing it really is. God, your patience for us is unbelievable. Thank you. God, I pray that as you ministered to me this week and woke me up to something that was so familiar and helped me to realize, Calvin, do you fully understand and appreciate what I did for you that first Christmas? God, I pray that we will respond different. Just as Joseph and Mary both responded different. Help us to respond different to your word that you have shared with us this morning and that we will set time aside to not allow Christmas just to become so familiar, but we will set time aside to allow your spirit to impact our hearts as we recount together as a church family in our own homes just how incredible your love for us is and how you made it possible for us to have our sins forgiven and to be reconciled to you through the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. We are eternally grateful and we will be a people who will intentionally recount so that we will not lose the amazement that you, God, came to be with us, Emmanuel. What great news. Father, we ask your blessing upon the advancement of your mission this afternoon and this evening through the performances. Lord, you know that many of your servants are struggling with coughs and colds and sicknesses. I just ask you to touch their bodies. The enemy would want nothing more than the good news of this new life we enjoy in Christ to be hampered. But God, greater are you that lives in us than he that's in the world. So God, may your word go forward, not only this morning, but this afternoon and this evening. And God, would you be gracious and merciful and give people the gift of faith to believe in Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. We love you and we will live our lives as people who take your word seriously. Through our obedience, we will show you our genuine love. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. May God bless you. Please pray for the gospel presentations this afternoon. We love you. Go and represent the kingdom of our Savior Jesus Christ well. God bless.